The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome back, everyone, or to our first-time participants. Welcome to the Economic Development Webinar Series. My name is Ben Kennedy. I'm with the Regional Programs and Engagement Branch of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade and Technology, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I'm located in Victoria, BC, on the unceded Coast Salish Territory of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. Today's webinar is on community economic development and how the principles it follows can help your communities build resiliency to the ups and downs of economic change. But first, just some housekeeping. On your attendee control panel, you'll see the orange arrow lets you shrink the panel to the side of the screen. It automatically shrinks if you don't do anything for a while. Below that, the orange microphone shows that you're muted. That is fixed to mute for this webinar, while the blue box lets you expand the whole webinar interface to full screen. Below that, the little hand can be clicked to notify me that you want to speak, but because there are many of you, the best way to raise a question is to enter your question in the questions box in your control panel, and I'll ask it for you either during the presentation or at the end. If we don't get to all of your questions, I will try to get you an answer via email after the webinar is finished. Finally, you have two options for connecting to audio, via your computer over VoIP or by phoning in. If you click on phone call, it'll give you a phone number to call with an access code for this webinar and a personal identification number for you individually. As a reminder, this session is being recorded and the presentation slides will be made available through our web pages noted on the screen. Okay, that's it, so let's get to it. Our presentation today is an overview of community economic development, what it is and how in a time of increasing economic and environmental change, you can incorporate it into your economic development efforts to build resiliency for your community. I will be attended today by my colleague, Alex Zachinuk, who will be giving us a sneak peek at some results from the 2018 Local Economic Development Survey and providing some tips for how you can use data from it to inform your decision making. But before that, though, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jeremy Stone. Jeremy has over 17 years of community economic development experience throughout North America and internationally. His career has included nonprofit lending to historically marginalized entrepreneurs, community economic development planning with rural and urban communities, and extensive small business technical assistance and consulting. He's also a leader in economic resilience and has worked on various disaster recoveries, including Hurricane Katrina, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the economic recovery of Lower Manhattan after 9-11, and the 2013 Colorado floods. Jeremy is currently the Director of the Community Economic Development Program at Simon Fraser University and is completing a PhD in Community and Regional Planning at the University of British Columbia. Jeremy Stone, thanks for coming to speak with us today. Let me yeah, thanks so much. give you control. All right. All right. Are we good to go? Good to go. All right. So uh, welcome everyone, thanks for uh, joining us today. Uh, so today I'll be speaking about uh, resilience and uh, community economic development and how they work together. Um, so just to give a little bit of background on me and the program here, uh, the Simon Fraser University Community Economic Development Program has been around for 30 years, started in 1989, and uh, it's worked with hundreds and hundreds of practitioners across Western Canada. Uh, currently, we're housed in the faculty environment, and we take a really quadruple bottom line focus, uh, bringing together economy, social equity, environment, and cultural appropriateness into our work. Um, me, you've heard a little bit about my bio. I, I've been doing this for about 18 years now. And um, the big thing, I think, for, for today's purposes, is that besides a background in community economic development that whole time, I've also been doing uh, disaster recovery in multiple contexts, uh, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Harvey, uh, Colorado floods, um, and many others uh, started with 9-11 um, a long time ago. And, um, and so, you know, over time have really seen how community economic development and economic resilience can work together. Uh, just a quick overview of what we do here, if you're ever interested. Uh, we have a certificate program for uh, professionals um, who do economic development or want to integrate community economic development into their other practices. Uh, we have lots of uh, government leaders uh, who take this certificate and then use it in their, their daily work. Uh, we also have a social economy accelerator uh, where we usually partner with organizations like Community Futures 
and uh, then provide uh, uh, startup programming for local entrepreneurs. And then we also have our community economic resilience work where we uh, do planning and workshops with communities locally uh, to help them figure out uh, how to do um, you know, their economic resilience planning. Um, we've also been doing a lot of research lately, uh, recently have been collaborating with the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development uh, to help them think through uh, community economic development uh, nationally and what could be applied here in the province. So uh, today we'll be going through uh, a few different areas. One is just framing uh, what uh, community economic development and resilience is all about. Uh, then followed by some cases, and then uh, looking more specifically at planning. So first, uh, just to iterate the risks, um, you know, every single uh, presentation on anything disaster related has to start with the big scary slide. And so this is your big scary slide for today. Um, basically, uh, you know, the number of disasters have been increasing over time. And I think what's interesting about this, uh, the right side of the slide, is just noting how many losses are, are uninsured. Um, you know, there's just a lot of losses that are happening that are not covered by, um, by typical uh, funding schemes. And so, you know, we have to be thinking about, well, what do we do in society to deal with all of these people who are not uh, protected in some way uh, financially? Um, there's lots of other ways that they're not protected as well. but. You know, I think that uh, there's a large gap there that we still have to focus on. And part of that is, you know, improving the insurance industry, et cetera. But part of it is really improving the way that we deliver services. Uh, here in BC, as you can see on the left, you know, just in the, the 2017 season between floods and wildfires, you know, all of those dots in there are communities that were impacted or areas that had some sort of fire. Um, and, and clearly, you know, there's a need uh, in our province to be concerned about uh, not only resilience in general, but especially economic resilience. So the a few things, you know, sometimes people are critical of being involved in the economy uh, because they say that, you know, businesses take care of themselves and that we should be really focused on uh, people and, and not businesses. But, you know, to me, that's wrong. Um, really, we, we have a really big need to focus on businesses and there's some clear reasons why. You know, the first is that the majority of our critical life needs are provided by businesses. When you leave your home every day, the majority of what you get from the outside world is provided by businesses, food, clothing, medicine, even the home that you live in was built by contractors usually that were in the private sector. Um, you know, the majority of what we get access to, uh, the private businesses provide. So we need to bring them online as soon as possible after a disaster. Secondly, uh, after evacuations in particular, businesses are the beacons of recovery. Uh, we've seen that in Fort Mac and um, New Orleans and other places where when you completely shut down a town or a large portion of the town and people leave, when they come back, they're going to look for those critical lifelines. Is my job back? Is the grocery store back? Is the pharmacy back? And if those things are back, they're going to go back to where they're staying and wait it out. And this is especially critical when you're looking at a disaster that happens in, say, you know, July or August, uh, because if the new school year starts and those people are, are gone, then, you know, they'll enroll their kids locally in those other communities and they might not ever come back. So, you know, it's very critical to bring businesses back online as quickly as possible so that people can just live their daily lives. Uh, businesses provide incomes, goods and services for the individual recoveries. So, you know, when people are trying to rebuild their houses um, or trying to, you know, just get their lives back on track, they need uh, businesses to pay them income so that then they can spend it on their personal recovery. They need to buy goods and services from businesses. So uh, if we want our communities to come back more rapidly, we need businesses to be there to support them. And then finally, uh, local businesses are accountable uh, to the community and they reduce capital leakage. There's two points here. One is that, you know, after Katrina, especially, we saw tons and tons of uh, contractor fraud. And, and what happens in all disasters is that when something goes haywire, you'll often have lots of people in vans come from out of town or out of province and they will, you know, start trying to provide goods and services. 
Some of them are really great, but some of them uh, end up taking people's money and taking off, or they provide really poor services or, or provide uh, shoddy work, and then um, they can't be found afterwards. So the more that we work with local businesses, the more accountable they are, and they can be tracked down if anything goes wrong, but usually they're also really invested in doing a good job for the community. The second part of that is reducing capital leakage. So this refers to the notion that uh, when you spend money locally into local businesses, a larger percentage of that money uh, stays in the community. It's usually a ratio of anywhere from three to one to five to one to 10 to one, depending on the business. And so, uh, you know, people need money uh, after disasters to be able to do all these things. And if you're putting money into chain stores or putting money into out of area businesses, then a lot of that money leaves just when people need it the most. So trying to support local businesses, you know, has a revolving effect that supports local economies and recovery. And then finally, you know, definitely finally this time, uh, businesses need support and capacity too. Um, the, the notion that businesses take care of themselves and that they're okay just because they make income is wrong. Uh, generally, businesses are going through twin tragedies. They're dealing with both the loss of like a home or loss of loved ones or you know, personal trauma, and then also the loss of their business or you know, some sort of business-related trauma. So between the two, um, you know, business owners are under a great deal of stress and they generally don't have a lot of capacity especially small business owners, uh, you know, they're always really focused on just trying to make a business run. Uh, they don't necessarily know how to na navigate bureaucracies and get access to capital in these times of need. Um, so they need support and help. And, and usually the only folks who can do that are nonprofit organizations, government, et cetera. So the, the big point, I think, for, for this talk is really how um, economic development and economic recovery and resilience actually work together. Um, Judith Rodan from the Rockefeller Foundation, who's been involved in the 100 Resilient Cities, they've been doing work all over the world in, in this field. Um, you know, her argument is, is that when you're investing into resilience, you have benefits in the short term. Uh, because a lot of times what you're doing for economic resilience um, like economic diversification and workforce support, et cetera, that all has short-term impacts. That, that grows the economy in the meantime. And then in case of disaster, uh, there are these you know, sort of unintended consequences that you're more resilient. And so focusing on in, embedding resilience into your daily economic development uh, has both short-term and long-term returns. So, you know, some of you may not be more familiar with e community economic development, um, but, you know, CED has a, a lot of different definitions. This is the one that I like the most. Um, CED is a systems approach to problem solving for community well-being. Now, you know, to break that down, uh, you know, first problem solving. Um, businesses and entrepreneurs are really problem solvers. It's not just that they sell things, it's that they're figuring out how to solve the problems of people locally. People need access to grain, they need access to clothes, they need access to this or that. And so business owners and entrepreneurs are figuring out, huh, I bet I can get that and I can sell that and make a living in the process. So you know, economic systems are constantly problem solving for us. And CED says, well, it's not just um, you know, jobs and, and income that promotes that, but it's a whole systemic approach. It's the entire society and community and how we sort of work on things like housing or work on education and other things to bring those together and, and improve community well-being through the process. Some of the principles of CED uh, include being livelihoods focused. So not just looking at, at you know, 40 hour a week jobs, but looking at the whole continuum of how people you know, create their livelihoods. And sometimes that's just small business opportunities or you know, um, informal trade, et cetera. Uh, diverse and inclusive, making sure that everyone in the community is, is included. Um, so, you know, when we do our economic development planning, that we're actually looking at folks with barriers or people who have been traditionally marginalized. Uh, sustainability, so making sure that not only that our economy is financially sustainable, but also environmentally sustainable and culturally appropriate for, for all people who live in that community. Uh, Place-based, really working off the strengths of a community and the assets. Um, 
in this way, it's really set opposed to um, uh, attraction strategies most often. It doesn't mean that you can't do attraction strategies when you're doing community economic development, but there has to be more focus on, well, how do we actually work with the assets we have? How do we build and grow local businesses? How do we spend into local businesses uh, to, to keep that vibrant? And then finally, community controlled, um, you know, making sure that the economy and the planning for it and whatnot is done by the community um, so that it represents community interests and community desires. Some examples of community economic development include uh, business retention and expansion. So a lot of the work that community futures do across uh, the province in supporting local businesses and, and growing them. You know, social enterprise and innovation, uh, creating businesses that are focused not just on financial returns, but also social and environmental returns. Uh, Buy local programs, social uh, procurement programs. Uh, you know, in Nelson, they have a, a pretty great social procurement policy. Um, you know, making sure that the local businesses are supported whenever we're buying. And then uh, finally, you know, and this is not the, the only things that are part of community economic development, but the final example is just, uh, you know, community-based financing. Uh, there's a lot of great work that's being done by Eden Yesh and, and others on community investment co-ops, uh, trying to uh, find how we can, you know, better pool local money to support local business. So bringing all these ideas together, both the community economic development and the resilience, <clears throat> I, I'd like to talk about this as community economic resilience. Um, so you know, maintaining our well-being while adjusting to constant changes in the world around us. Uh, changes may be you know, very stark, like a, a forest fire and a flood, but they can be things that happen um, not just in a disaster context, like uh, mill closures or other factory closures, or they can be things that happen over time as, you know, pine beetle spreads in areas or economic downturns in, uh, in you know, a small town downtowns. All of these are, are different uh, changes. And, and the goal is, is how can we accept those changes and weather those changes while still having our same level of well-being? You know, how can we keep a level of uh, happiness and security uh, through all these changes? So to uh, explain what I mean by this a little bit more, we'll look at a few cases from around the province and then also North America more generally, and, and talk about how um, people integrate community economic development and resilience or use community economic development to contribute to resilience. So uh, first example is uh, Fogo Island in, uh, in Newfoundland. Um, what's interesting about Fogo Island is that they were a predominantly uh, fishing-based community for, you know, a century, and then, um, and then they started to see the beginnings of a downturn. And they developed a foundation called the Shorefast Foundation that um, started to not only invest locally, but then buy up assets and convert them and build more diversification. So, um, you know, a couple of things that they did that were interesting was one, they started making sure that all of these social enterprises that they were starting were all connected to each other so that all of the uh, furniture that's in their their hotel is crafted by local artisans who are in a you know furniture based uh, cooperative uh, and so all of these different businesses work together support each other then they also have these things like the economic nutrition label uh, where they try to communicate very directly to consumers and the local community of how much money they're really putting back in locally. So in this case, if you can see the small writing of Fogo Island, you know, 63% of their uh, economic benefits go back there, 7% to Newfoundland more generally, Canada more generally, 24%, et cetera. And so, you know, two things are happening here. One is that they're educating uh, their local community to buy local, to support um, you know, community businesses, to develop more community-based businesses. But then also they've created some real buffers to uh, variations in the fishing industry. And, and as that has collapsed more fully, they've been able to, to weather that and, and be able to have a, a healthy economy despite it. Uh, here in BC, um, Chequemus Community Forest, uh, just outside of Whistler. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, example because uh, what they did here was uh, you know, create a community forest. It was 
you know, public-private partnership in that um, higher senior levels of government devolved uh, the forest control to the local community. Uh, they developed an organization to manage that. And then um, even though they still continue to have uh, cuts in the forest, they've reduced those cuts and started investing into other types of uh, businesses. So one is the, the tourism side. So they developed this uh, beautiful center that is used for all kinds of events. Uh, they've put in more uh, programming into the forest uh, to bring people in to use it. Uh, but then they've also um, started uh, using carbon offsets as a way to monetize the forest without cutting it down. So uh, they were able to sell those offsets on the market. Uh, it's a kind of a complicated approach and it's not one that's necessarily gonna work in every community. But what is interesting about it is that they reduced the reliance on the forestry aspect of the forest, were able to diversify. And what's also cool about this is just looking at the, uh, the structure itself that they built for the center, it's raised, it's very sensible to the floodplain so that uh, it's right on the banks of, of a river so that if there is flooding, that asset doesn't get impacted. Uh, they're still able to, um, you know, to reuse it in the future. So, you know, this is a really great example of, of development that is, you know, sensitive to a uh, potential disaster, but then is also diversifying and being very community focused. Uh, Kanaka Bar Band uh, is a very interesting example, also from here in BC. Uh, what, uh, if you hear the, the stories they tell it, uh, they have a really great description on the website and I encourage you to go check it out. Um, but, you know, they basically found that by the 70s and 80s, the toll of colonialism had really, you know, run a, a deep course. And, you know, they said, we want to be able to, to be self-sufficient and self-reliant. And, and so they started focusing on local planning uh, to take over you know, local assets and resources and build uh, a really um, you know, sustainable and resilient economy and society. And so uh, they started doing that over the course of 20, 30 years now. Um, they've you know, bought up a number of um, uh, assets locally, a gravel pit. Um, they got access to the, the water supply there, um, have been doing a, a lot of really uh, interesting business developments uh, around those things. And, and, and have also focused on education and employment. So now, you know, recently there was an interview where uh, they had, you know, mentioned that they had 100% employment now and 100% graduation rate for band members. And, you know, another interesting part of this is now they've turned their eye towards climate change. And they've said, you know, we believe in climate change, we're going to prepare for it. And so they've taken the same approach to their, you know, asset assessment early on in their community economic development work and saying, well, what do we have locally that we can build on and have translated that into a vulnerability assessment. And so now they're assessing, well, how do we actually, um, you know, identify what our vulnerabilities are? How do we contribute back to, um, you know, plugging those vulnerabilities and making us more resilient? And, and I'm really excited to see where they go with this, but I, I think just the, the planning aspect of it alone is really inspiring. Uh, by local campaigns, uh, they're a real favorite of mine. Uh, not everybody is, is into them as others, but you know, I think that just uh, a constant uh, education of, of local people around buying locally is important. Uh, after the Joplin tornado in Missouri, uh, the, the city was devastated. Um, it ripped through town, as you can see in that uh, impact path map. Uh, and most of that was down through their commercial corridor. And so they had 485 businesses that were impacted. And what was great about them is that they immediately went into action. So the mayor and chamber of commerce got out there, started messaging, you know, you have to shop locally, you have to shop Joplin uh, because we need that money to stay locally right now. And, and then they, you know, developed signs and there were big green signs that they would put in front of any business because um, mo all the businesses sort of looked the same, whether you were open or closed, it all looked really ragged. So all the ones that were open, they created the signs, they put them out front. They were like, hey, open for business. It was very bright and attractive. And, and they just got going. And, and that's turned into a longer term, um, you know, by local campaign. And what was, was interesting is that, um, you know, they had a, a ton of businesses reopen, the majority of their businesses reopened, and then they had new businesses even come out of that. 
And, you know, statistically speaking, that bucked every trend. Um, you know, the, the majority of the, um, you know, areas that are impacted by disaster show that maybe 25% to half of your businesses come back. You know, many go out of business either right away or within the first two years. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty bad scenario in most cases for a catastrophic disaster. So for them to have such a great uh, recovery is, is just outstanding. And I think this example shows both, you know, how um, you know, a buy local campaign could be repurposed for a, you know, local resilience campaign, but then also how, um, you know, it can, a disaster like this can bring people together and sort of chart them on a, a localism path that will sustain the economy in the future. Another good example of, of uh, community futures work, especially is here in, in BC, uh, following the 2017 fires, um, you know, uh, the Caribou region, those CFs uh, started working to uh, bring uh, financial assistance to the local community. And, um, and you know, they were very flexible in their financing. They had you know, low cost financing. They had one page applications. It was very simple and straightforward. Um, and then when they got it out to the community, um, people, you know, it wasn't just their borrowers who were allowed to borrow. They were allowed other businesses to come and, and borrow. And even if people had poor credit, they worked with them to, um, to still get access to financing. They just had to rejig some of the, the requirements. Uh, overall, I think there are, you know, two or three great lessons out of this. You know, one is that the existing flexible financing from a community economic development perspective was already in place. That infrastructure was there for rapid response after disaster. And if you know anything about uh, you know, recovery financing in the province or just really in North America more generally, outside sources take a long time. It'll often take six months or nine months or even a year. Uh, many of the people in the Caribou region had been facing um, you know, insurance payout delays um, some up to 14 months. Uh, so being able to have, you know, a lender that exists that already does, you know, on the ground, you know, like uh, sort of character-based lending or, you know, enough of that technical assistance around lending that banks normally can't do, um, you know, that already builds up a local economy to be more resilient. But then after a disaster, you know, there are those opportunities to, uh, to, you know, sort of change direction, focus more on recovery financing and support businesses that have been impacted. Uh, one last note on this one is that uh, the, the CFs, and, and this isn't just in the Caribou, um, you know, also Grand Forks uh, Community Futures Boundary uh, did the same thing, but, you know, they worked really hard on restructuring loans, giving interest holidays, uh, you know, payment holidays, that sort of thing so that um, businesses were able to, to have sort of a breather during this time. And not all banks can do that. And it's great to see when both banks and you know, nonprofit institutions, et cetera, are, are able to, to fill that gap. Um, heading back to uh, New Orleans, um, I'm originally from the Gulf Coast and I've spent a lot of time there. And also we have a lot of disasters down there, so we've gotten pretty good at some of this. Um, but there's two last examples that I'll just draw from my work there uh, that I think really translates anywhere. Uh, one is the uh, New Orleans Office of Workforce Development. And what's really interesting about them is that they spend a lot of time working with people with barriers, working with people coming, you know, through public assistance um, and trying to, you know, connect them to job opportunities. Now, one of the, the interesting parts about this is that whenever they hold a job fair for, for anyone for regular jobs, they keep a list of people and they, they always ask them, are you available to work after a disaster? Because they found that those people who are going through their offices are usually the first ones dis displaced. Um, you know, they're low skilled labor, they're, they usually don't have a lot of job opportunities. And so, um, you know, they always ask them, are you available to work in, in case there's a disaster? They keep a database of those names. And then when something happens, uh, and it invariably does, but when something does happen, then they have that list to draw upon. So usually the first uh, people to call are the, uh, the parks department because they need people doing debris removal. So they start calling all the people on the list and saying, hey, are you around to do debris removal? And they start bringing those people over. 
but they also have outside businesses who call and say, hey, you know, we're looking for 10 people to join a job site or, or this or that. And so they're able to start connecting those people to jobs. It's a very simple action to, to maintain that list, but it has profound impacts because if people are gonna be out of work for a month or two months or six months, um, especially those who are on the margins of income uh, stability, you know, that, that has a huge impact for them. So, you know, I really like this approach. And then finally, uh, the Southeast Louisiana Fisheries Assistance Center. Uh, this was something that I worked on, uh, gosh, uh, 13, 14 years ago now. Um, and so that's uh, my little fresh face in the back, um, the tall guy on the right. Um, and you know what we found was that when we were responding to uh, the recovery, that um, the fishermen especially, uh, they were impacted in ways that like other people weren't necessarily. So they have a lot of different needs from lots of different agencies. So permitting and licensing agencies in, in the state capital and then banks that might be in another area and then Red Cross and other uh, folks were in different areas. And, and we just found that a lot of people didn't know all the resources that were out there. They, um, they had a lot of needs that were going unmet. So uh, we worked together with state and federal leaders. We brought together um, a, a good amount of money and we got a free trailer from uh, the, the uh, local parish. And then we put it all together and started the center. And it was a one-stop shop for people to come through. They were able to get access to all forms of, of assistance. Um, all the agencies were co-located. Um, and, and not only was this good for that disaster, but then we just kept it afterwards. So then that became a hub for all commercial fishermen to come back to and get access to resources um, for you know, just their daily business needs. And then when the BP oil spill happened, they already knew where to go. And, and so they all just came back. And then we started doing you know, grant processing and loan processing and, and all kinds of other services. Um, so, you know, I think it's a really great example of how, you know, creating hubs for uh, small business or for, you know, business retention and expansion, uh, those can be used uh, as your, your um, you know, points of, of connection to communities during disaster. And, and again, it's that blend of the economic development and community economic resilience. Uh, so finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about planning. Um, I noticed on the invite list that there were um, a lot of folks who um, you know were coming from local governments and, and whatnot. So um, you know, I, I think the the first thing I always hear when I talk about this stuff is, "Wow, we can't do that. It's too expensive. You know, we don't have the staff for it." And I completely feel your pain. Um, I get it. Uh, but I think that there are lots of ways to do this that are cheaper um, and that are incremental in nature. So the, the first place to start is to just think, well, how do our plans support economic resilience? Um, generally, people have, uh, you know, communities have economic development strategies or um, economic development plans, and, and even they have emergency management plans, but it's rare that any of those plans have anything to do with resilience or have resilience incorporated or you know, economic resilience in particular in the emergency management plans. So an example of this is uh, some work I did after the uh, Colorado floods. We went and visited 25 communities. We developed like this 52 point uh, matrix where we looked at every single plan and then economic development plan and then had all their other plans from that community and we sort of surveyed the whole thing and we looked at them from the perspective of research and knowledge building for resilience. Do they have recovery planning embedded? Do they have governance structures like a connection to emergency management in their economic development plans, et cetera? And, and we knew what the results would be. Um, and they came back pretty much as expected. Uh, those blue bars are not observed in the plans. Um, the majority of what we were looking for was just not there. And, and we went back and did interviews afterward with all of these communities and asked them specifically about their plans and said, you know, we didn't see any of this in there. Was it somewhere else? Is it like, you know, just common knowledge between you that you don't have written down? And they said, no, that's pretty accurate. You know, we haven't been thinking about that stuff. Or if they have been thinking about it, they haven't gotten to the level of planning yet. 
And, and so this, you know, this is potentially problematic, um, but it's also an opportunity uh, where we can start thinking about, well, how do we embed um, some of these concepts into our plans? If you think it's just Colorado, um, last year, oh, last year we did um, a, a piece, well, we did a little review of plans in the Kootenays area, not to pick on the Kootenays at all, but I just happened to be going there and I looked at a lot of local plans and, and it had the same, same effect, you know, there are just a lot of things that are not observed. So this isn't something that's like bad, like people haven't, you know, caught on and they're behind. It's just that we haven't gotten to this point yet where we've really started realizing how we can embed this into our planning. And so I think, you know, some of the work that we're doing at the CED program and that the province is doing, um, you know, especially at the ministry level is trying to think, well, how do we actually connect these things together? So uh, one way to, um, to start thinking about this is a, a whole community approach. Uh, the whole community approach has, um, you know, made it pretty big in the States. FEMA has adopted this approach and, and it's also been started to be adopted here in Canada. Uh, but the whole idea is, um, you know, government is not completely responsible for disasters and businesses aren't completely responsible for economic recovery. There's a whole group of people in the community who own little bits and pieces and who can contribute little bits and pieces. So like colleges and universities, they have uh, business programs where there are lots of faculty and staff and students who can support you know, planning processes, they can support uh, information gathering from the community, uh, they can even implement some of the technical assistance programming on the back end. Um, emergency managers have a role to play just in coordinating their activities with the private sector. Uh, the business technical assistance providers like Community Futures, like other nonprofit organizations, uh, have a, a real strong uh, role to play. Chambers of Commerce in both representing business interests, but also pushing out information and organizing businesses. Uh, financial institutions developing products that are appropriate for uh, you know, emergency management and recovery. I'm making sure that money is flexible, um, that is already out there so that you know, repayment uh, plans can actually weather these disruptions. Uh, other nonprofits and associations. So um, you know, I teach a course at Tulane on economic uh, recovery. And the, the one thing that I have all my students do, because uh, they're mostly social work students, so they have nothing to do with economic development or recovery. But I talk to them about, well, what are, you know, have a, take a, a local nonprofit and write an economic resilience plan from their point of view. So it could be um, an association of uh, food workers, or it could be an immigrant association, LGBT, uh, you know, any kind of organization. All of those organizations have uh, businesses in their communities that are important to them, that perhaps they represent or they liaise with. All of them can do really great case management with those businesses. They can be set up after a disaster to have their own little plans to focus on, okay, well, all of our LGBT serving businesses, we're gonna reach out to them and make sure that they get access to support. Or, you know, all of the, um, you know, tourism based businesses or, you know, local, um, you know, food based businesses, we're just gonna work in our lanes. And so, um, you know, I think it's really important to rely on those organizations to provide support services and do that case management. Individual residents all have a role. Um, you know, there's a lot of volunteerism that can be done, but I think it's also just motivating them to buy locally and support uh, their local businesses. And then, you know, finally, labor unions, uh, other labor organizations, anything that represents the workforce is, is really critical to involve. So a couple of examples of planning. Uh, one that I, I think is really great and it's catching on, it's something that we're doing now at Simon Fraser, is, to, uh, is this Resilientville uh, approach that they started doing in San Francisco. And, and what they did was bring together sort of the, the community development, community economic development strategies with resilience and say, well, how do we do, you know, place-based um, resilience planning? And so really looking at what are the local assets, what do we rely on in all these different areas? And then what do we, um, what do, we do with the gaps? You know, what are the vulnerabilities there? And so they'll bring together all these community members, go through a mapping process, talk it through of like, well, what does, you know, 
Like, what do we want? Like, what businesses do we need to return? What sort of development do we need to do in the short term to like fill the gaps? But then after a disaster, what are we gonna do if we have gaps remaining? And so uh, it's a really great approach that's uh, catching on kind of globally at this point. Uh, I know they're doing some in Battersea in England and then doing it in Vancouver. Um, so, um, so, you know, it's been a pretty great uh, approach. Um, a, a more local um, uh, version is in Port Coquitlam. Um, I, I like to use this uh, photo of Tara Stroop. She's um, uh, the, one of the emergency managers in, in Port Coquitlam, and, and she's a really amazing person. And, and I think this kind of photoshopped image that they have out there is, is great of her because, um, because really um, she's in some ways single-handedly move forward um, the the process of preparation for um, economic recovery or economic resilience. And, and she just realized at some point as she was doing some educational work that they didn't have a lot for recovery planning. And so, uh, so the first thing that she did, especially in the business sector, was to go out and do a survey and just find out, like, are you prepared for a disaster? You know, do you have insurance? Do you have these supports, et cetera? And once she got more information, she knew a little bit more about the gaps. She went back out and did uh, these discovery sessions where they would bring together business owners and sort of vet what they had heard from the surveys. Then they started doing, once they got an idea from the business owners of what they wanted, then they started doing uh, continuity planning workshops where they would go through different aspects like, you know, what do you do in case of utility loss or what do you do in case of uh, insurance, et cetera. And, and then finally, you know, she started bringing in, um, you know, bigger players to sort of give their case study approaches. So uh, she brought in the Walmart Emergency Operations Center. They carry on a 24 hour a day, 365 day a year emergency operations centers for their communities all across uh, North America. Um, and, and she brought in others um, to, to sort of explain like how they go about dealing with economic resilience. Um, all of this has been done on a shoestring budget. Uh, almost all the people that she's had involved have been working on a volunteer basis. Um, they have gotten some pieces of money here and there to fund it, but you know, I think it's a really great example of A, the shoestringing of, of this kind of work, and then B, um, just the fact that you can have one local champion who picks this up and carries it forward. Um, she's been recognized by UBCM and others for this work, and you know, I just think that if we could sort of replicate this model in other parts of the province, um, you know, there'd be a, a real strengthening of economic resilience. Um, so takeaways, um, you know, there's a few sets of takeaways I have here. One is to learn and work incrementally. I always encourage people to either establish or commandeer a regular meeting uh, group or round table you know, like get a task force together. And it doesn't have to be from scratch. It could be some you know, group that already exists, but just infiltrate that group and then start, you know, promoting this message and get people to start focusing on learning and planning. Um, you know, one good thing is to collaborate with partners to do some low cost uh, research. So collaborate with local universities or local nonprofits. Try to get out there and have them do some surveys on your behalf or do some you know, ground truthing. Find out what your vulnerabilities are, the opportunities, the gaps. And, and then once you get all that research together, make a list. I mean, to me, it's really as simple as that. If you can make a list for, um, for like all these possibilities, then you can hopefully um, you know, move forward and, and develop uh, an approach. Running low on batteries, I apologize if it's a problem. Um, and then the, finally, once um, you make that list, support the execution of the list. And, and I think the, um, the, the point here is to support it. It's not that any of you have to actually execute the list on your own, but support bringing that whole community together to uh, talk about these issues. Um, so the next takeaway is to just repurpose assets to reduce uh, costs and time. There's a ton of stuff out there that already exists. Call centers and info guides. 
you know, that you can use for, um, for recovery, uh, sister city and corporate MOUs, um, you know, just this whole list, case management that exists already, uh, programs that exist, all of these things can be sort of crafted towards a, um, an economic resilience model, and you can embed all of these assets into a plan. And then finally, just start small and workshop it. You know, I think a lot of times people think, oh, well, we need to go out and get a hundred thousand dollar grants and like make this big, you know, system to do all this stuff. I mean, I I don't agree with that at all. Um, what we're doing is in the CED program now is working with communities to just do small, low cost planning exercises. You know, the one approach is to to actually do use a planning tool that we've made to sit down with local leaders and go through, you know, what are the, the risks locally to the economy? What can you do to mitigate it? You know, set the priorities and the cost, and then you just sort it and you've got your list right there of things that you can work on over the year, over two years, 10 years. Um, we're also doing planning exercises where, you know, we can sit down with the community and have them sort of go through well, what are scenarios locally, what are assets, and putting them together to create sort of a mitigation or recovery plan. Um, this stuff doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be super time consuming. But once you've gone through them, then you have a roadmap of, of where you want to go. And if you want to dig deeper and spend a lot more money, you can. But if you don't, you can work with that whole community to parcel out little pieces and, and have them take it forward. So that's it for me. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for, for paying attention and being involved. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much, Jeremy. That was a, a really interesting and thorough presentation. So, uh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Over that with all of us. Um, if there are Thank any you. questions, please put them in the question box and I'll be happy to ask uh, Jeremy them. But I did have just one question from your presentation. Like, it sounds like you've been working across multiple communities uh, across the US and BC and have you found that there's some commonly overlooked aspects of community economic development and resiliency planning that you find again and again when you come into these communities that you could identify and maybe uh, stop it happening in the future? Um, here, let me uh, change my audio again. Um, you know, what I would say is that um, there's generally, there's generally two commonalities. One is that um, people are, they have some trepidation around this. You know, it's like there's generally not enough um, uh, understanding or belief that this can happen. There's a lot of fear and, and I think rightful fear that, you know, governments have and emergency managers have on taking on this kind of stuff. And so, um, so you know, there's you you get into a community and you're like, hey, here's all the things you can do, and they're like, ah, I don't know, like you know, I don't think I can I can get to that right now. And so, you know, partly it's trying to just sort of walk people through and give them the easy pieces to um, to start building up and craft the narrative locally so that people think that it's possible. Um, and then the other thing that I noticed is that people have a ton of assets that they're just not utilizing so much. So you know, they've got um, you know, great leaders locally who are embedded in the community, they have lots of knowledge, but it's just not all being organized down this track. And so, um, you know, I think that that's the, the useful part of the planning exercises is to just really be able to map your entire community and say, hey, we've already got a lot of infrastructure for resilience already. We just need to, to do it. So, um, yeah, th those would, to me would be the two big commonalities. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thanks for that. Um, so I've got no more questions, but uh, before we go, I just wanted to introduce my colleague Alex to talk about the 2018 Community uh, Local Economic Development Survey. So I'll pass it over to you, Alex, who's just been hiding over here in the corner. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, good morning, folks. So yeah, I just want to speak quickly to um, a few results in the survey we did recently that I think can actually help put some of what Jeremy said in context in terms of what the next steps can be for us as communities in BC moving forward with the way the ecosystem kind of is now, and hopefully that's helpful to you in your planning. Um, so this survey was in the field from September to October of 2018, uh, and it targeted people, anyone working in economic development, so whether that's through local governments or regional groups, nonprofits, tourism organizations, those kinds of people, 
Uh, and just to get a sense of their priorities, kind of what they want to do, what they're struggling to do, uh, what they're working on now, their goals, and try to roll some of that together. And there's a few findings from that survey that I think uh, can be useful here. The full, was, the full results aren't public yet. So this is kind of a sneak peek of things that seem relevant to the topic at hand. Uh, so to open it up and going to, to Jeremy's point about you know, this concept of community economic development is a more kind of holistic view in this sort of quadruple bottom line idea. Uh, we had asked people what their main economic development priorities were in the long run. And I think you see really good evidence here that a, a kind of broader, more holistic perspective is developing. So most popular now and you know forever and always is creating jobs, kind of the bread and butter of traditional active. But improving residents' quality of life, the sort of more holistic idea, comes before even uh, raising incomes. So there is evidence that people are starting to think about this in a more multimodal way. Growing population environmental sustainability, both seen as kind of equally important throughout BC. So do as you're engaging in these conversations and reaching out to people about, you know, community active planning and resiliency as part of that. Bear in mind that views of active are expanding and these conversations are happening already. You're not going to have to start that from scratch. Uh, we didn't ask about resiliency in, in the survey specifically, unfortunately, but we did ask about sustainability and what people were doing to ensure their active was sustainable. Uh, and you'll see a good chunk of people, but still less than half, are using urban planning to prepare for natural disasters. And floods and wildfires are some of the more common. So that's starting to happen, but it's still less than half of communities, and it's certainly fewer communities than are at risk of being affected by these things. Um, and a tiny minority, less than 10%, were using the technical options like uh, we had here, incorporating environmental risk management tools into ECDEV planning. Uh, very few people are doing that. Might be a capacity issue, might be a willingness or an awareness issue. But regardless, the takeaway from this is that right now, resiliency planning strategies, especially from an ECDEV perspective, uh, aren't happening very often. So there's, there's a lot of space to improve there as well. And then I want to close on a few points about uh, partnerships and creating partnerships in BC. Jeremy stressed a lot the importance of kind of bringing the right people together and, and working together to get this done. And even just among the priorities we asked about, which again didn't include resiliency, 36% of priorities in the province aren't being addressed through a partnership right now. So there's a huge, huge space to kind of start these conversations, have, start these, these partnerships to address these issues. Uh, odds are you're not being left behind. Odds are these conversations aren't happening yet. The other encouraging thing, especially to the point about kind of starting small and keeping things simple in the early days, people prefer less informal arrangements. Um, collaborative projects and personal connections were the preferred forms of collaboration throughout BC. So, you know, there, there's no need to kind of go into this, like Jeremy said, with a fully developed plan and everything ready and raring to go firing on all cylinders. Have some conversations. The opportunity is there. Just reach out to folks. That being said, do bear in mind that um, there's a pretty clear way in which people tend to prioritize the groups of people they work, reach out to, you know, chambers of commerce, other local governments, local businesses in general, so just kind of doing a blanket survey, those tend to come first. Some of the folks that Jeremy was mentioning as being very important, so reaching out to residents, uh, especially seniors, local businesses who serve a specific group or work in a particular sector, so, you know, either those that will be most impacted by a disaster or most necessary after a disaster. People almost never get around to talking to those kinds of groups doing that kind of targeted consultation. So the opportunities are there for conversations. You can start to have them, but you're going to have to reach out a little bit beyond your usual networks and, and look beyond the usual suspects for those collaborations to happen. So those are three takeaways that, um, yeah, not, not necessary to expand on what Jeremy said, but just to kind of put it in context of what we know about the way things look in BC right now. Views of active are expanding. Resiliency planning is still uncommon in the province. And there are opportunities for conversations if you look a little bit beyond those usual networks. So with that, I'll pass it back to Ben. If there's any other questions, I'm happy to field them. Or uh, you can follow up with uh, an email to economicdevelopment at gov.bc.ca. We can chat a little bit more there. And hopefully that helps you put some of this into action. Thanks a lot. And I'm back. Thanks for that, Alex. Um, that survey is not available yet, but um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, looking to the uh, middle of April, that's going to be available. So check out our website um, to get all of the, the results from that. Um, there's also, that'll be yeah, on our website, as I said, gov.bc.ca forward slash economic development. But you'll also find a lot of other resources on that website, um, such as a business retention and expansion tool, which is critical part of community economic development, um, so make sure to have a look on there. Um, let's just finish up with talking about some upcoming webinars. So April 25th, we've got our Community Gaming Grants Program webinar, and June 6th, What to Say to Foster Visitation Post-Wildfire Marketing Messages. So that's all about uh, you've had a 
wildfire obviously come through your community? Um, how can you re-attract tourism? Um, if you want to sign up to our email list, our webinar list, that's the URL. Um, and if you hear about in our webinars through other sources, you probably aren't on this list and we want you to be on there, so make sure you head there. And uh, when you're signing up, just note that the title is your job title and company name is your organization. And we're pretty much done for the day, but once you leave this webinar, there will be a window that pops up asking you to take a brief feedback survey. Please take a few minutes to respond as your feedback helps us improve this series. The recording of this webinar will go up on YouTube uh, for viewing and sharing. The link will be sent out by email to everyone who's registered on today's webinar and will be added to the Economic Development website in the VC Ideas Exchange area. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy, for your insightful presentation. And uh, we hope to see you all in the next couple of weeks. Bye.